You may know Sean Strube as the founder of Paz Magazine. You may know Sean Strube as a 30-year survivor with HIV. But do you know Sean Strube as a ping pong player? You ready? Sure. Is there anything this man can't do? We all have the same condition. It's called life. I'm living mine as a gay man and an addict in recovery who's dealing with aging and being a friend and finding happiness and staying healthy and having fun and enjoying laughter, all while living with HIV for more than 25 years. I'm Mark S. King, and this is my fabulous disease. Hi, it's Mark S. King, and welcome to my fabulous disease. And I am here with ping pong player extraordinaire, <laughs> Sean Struve. We're calling this Five things about HIV they're not telling you. You ready? Ready, go ahead. Number one, an undetectable viral load may rival a condom. A person who is undetectable and has been undetectable for some time, there is very little chance of them transmitting the virus sexually. The Swiss Federal AIDS Commission two years ago issued a statement saying that in serodiscordant couples where one person is positive and one person is negative, if the positive person has been on treatment and undetectable for at least six months, they didn't think the condoms were even necessary because the chance of transmission was so remote. A person who is on treatment and undetectable is extremely unlikely to transmit the virus sexually. That doesn't mean they never return. It's possible they can. In fact, condoms do have a failure rate. It might be 1%, it might be 3%, it might be 8%. There are different studies. Unprotected sex with people who are undetectable may be, it's possible, it's less risk than only having sex with a condom and being indifferent to the HIV status of the partners. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that condom will break and sometimes those condoms, those partners will be positive and not be undetectable. They may not even know that they're positive. They may be full of, of virus and very infectious. Mm -hmm. We have neglected to recognize the extent to which a person who is on treatment undetectable is rendered non-infectious. Just saying that is going to drive some people nuts. Condoms hopefully will be part of the equation for anyone who's trying to lower their risk. So you're not saying throw that out. No, you're simply no, saying... The safest, the safest route is the belt and suspenders approach. Is, <laughs> uh, is using a condom and, uh, and a, a, a positive partner who is also undetectable. Our number two thing they are not telling you about HIV is use a condom every time is a failure. They, I, I'm not sure I would categorize it as a failure. I'm calling it a failure right now. <laughs> very few people actually use condoms all the time. Uh, I know very few heterosexuals who use condoms all the time. If instead we focused on all different kinds of sexual activity, have different levels of risk, mm -hmm. but do not have intercourse and be a passive partner without making sure that your partner, the, the, the top, is using a condom. Are that, are that scenarios in which you have monogamous lovers being told by prevention people, use a condom every time, Absolutely. he might be cheating on you. No one would ever tell heterosexual couples they can never trust each other, ever. Mm -hmm. And yet that is what has been told to gay men since the beginning of the epidemic. And I think that has been very damaging to our psyche. I think it has been damaging to HIV prevention. That brings us to the number three thing they're not telling you about HIV prevention. Post-exposure prophylaxis is effective. For years in hospitals for needle sticks, nurses have been immediately put on some sort of HIV treatment regimen for a 30-day period typically. Yet, if two men are having sex and at 3 o'clock in the morning the condom breaks and there was a potential exposure, or someone does something that they regret and fear they could have been exposed, how come we don't make post-exposure prophylaxis available to them? It is available in some hospital emergency rooms, but it's complicated to get. You have to wait a long time. They may or may not offer it. You don't know. Uh, in New York, they typically charge for it, $1,500 or $1,600. You have to start it within a day or two of the exposure. The more time passes, the less effective it is. But what I've been doing is I give out a three-day, I call it a three-day starter kit, so that if something happens at 3 o'clock in the morning, or one typically can't, talk to one's doctor or, or you know, really assess what risk was there, they can begin an antiretroviral uh, treatment immediately 
and buy themselves some time, two or three days, until they can get to a clinic or talk to their physician or call an AIDS organization. The costs of preventing one infection, the savings of preventing one infection, is so great. You know, why don't we distribute these three-day starter kits? What do they think, we're stupid? Do you think that, do they, do they, the powers that be, think we're so reckless that we can't deal with the truth, with real information? It's perceived to be a disinhibitor, that if we tell people about post-exposure prophylaxis, a bunch of gay men are going to go out and be irresponsible sexually and, and not be concerned about it. Let's say I'm an HIV positive guy who has sex with someone last night, and he's negative, and the condom breaks. I'm topping him and the condom breaks. What do I do? Can I, do I just go to my medicine cabinet and say, okay, this is what I'm taking. Uh, here, here's a three-day supply. Go take this and see your doctor. It is something, it is better than nothing. The, the best thing is for them to have access to a doctor or a professional who can help them assess how much risk they're really at, and then if necessary, put them on a 28-day course of the appropriate antiretrovirals. And that brings us to number four of our things, five things that they're not telling us about HIV prevention. Number four, fear-based tactics don't change behavior. Uh, there is no evidence that fear-based uh, HIV prevention campaigns change sexual behaviors over the long term. And there's a lot of evidence that they don't. An interesting example of fear-based uh, messaging was this Australian um, public service announcement that you mentioned in your writing, and it was called the Grim Reaper ad. Gay men who viewed the ad were no more likely to practice safer sex as a result of that ad than they were before. In fact, there's some suggestion that they were more likely to be unsafe having viewed that ad. Secondly, heterosexual people identified the Grim Reaper as a gay man. The ad actually ended up further stigmatizing HIV men the research shows that this kind of an ad, it reinforces behavior for people who are already practicing the desired behavior. What it doesn't do is influence the sexual behavior of the men most at risk. We need to figure out a way to tell young gay men, you don't want to get HIV. It screws up your life, it's expensive, it makes intimate relationships very difficult, uh, and you're, even with treatment, you are uh, subject to a host of all sorts of problems. You know, a campaign in New York that showed these beautiful, very attractive, they looked like, you know, characters from the TV show Lost or something, and interspersed with, with you know, really extreme images of uh, side effects uh, from treatment, with bones snapping in half, and anal cancer. And they, it's true, people with HIV are much more likely to get anal cancers they are more likely to get osteoporosis. It's a really serious problem. There doesn't happen to everyone. Uh, to present that as what is typical of HIV uh, to young gay men, they know better because they know people who are positive. They don't see that around them. They spent $750,000 or $730,000 on that campaign. Uh, Broadway Cares provided a $5,000 grant to a young college student to create a website called pepnow.org. That website and that $5,000 investment from Broadway Cares will prevent, prevent more HIV infection than the New York City Health Department's $730,000 campaign. That and finally, the number five thing they're not telling us about HIV prevention, and we've really been touching on this the whole conversation, and that is gay sex has meaning. Eric Rofus was a gay philosopher and anthropologist who wrote a book that you should know about called Reviving the Tribe. And among other things that Eric wrote about in that book and in others was that his sex sexuality as a gay man is, first of all, meaningful to him, and second of all, not being respected by the powers that be, by governmental health officials, by, by health departments, when crafting HIV messages. This is a fundamental part of our lives. And until we hear that message from the public health authorities trying to do HIV prevention and, and elsewhere, uh, we're always going to have this disconnect where we're being told that we're less than, in so many words. We're being told that we're just potential infectors, that our sexuality is superfluous, is, a, is, a, is a, an excess or a silliness or a peccadillo uh, of, of these gay men that the rest of society is just going to, you know, they're going to try and put up with it and try and be tolerated. Um, that is uh, one of the underlying, one of the most fundamental problems we have in dealing with the epidemic. 
I'm going to include a lot of links in the blog text, so be sure to refer to those. I'm going to link to a lot of this research. I'm going to link to some of these public service announcements, both the good and the bad that we've been talking about, so that you can make your own decisions, and I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about it. As always, thank you for watching, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Mark. Now I need to beat you at the next game. Okay. Ping pong. Okay. Thanks a lot.